We are on air live. Hello, everyone. It's two minutes before two o'clock, and I'm here. My name is Christy Myrick, and I'm here with my colleague, Erica Woodard, and we both work for the Wake County Instructional Technology and Library Media Services team. And we're going to do a Digital Learning Day presentation all about why your elementary students should be using Google Apps. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, Erica's going to hang out on the side, and I'm going to switch this over to project my screen. Um, a link to the presentation will be available afterward. So I'm going to give it to you at the end, but there are some interactive links that we will look at throughout the presentation. I have a lot of information to share with you in roughly 45 minutes. And technically, we begin in one minute. So hang on while I share my screen, please. All right. Here we are. So again, my name is Christy Myrick, and today I'm going to talk about some really Google reasons your elementary students should be using Google Apps for education. Um, our learning outcomes are, hopefully you'll walk away with many different ideas for how you can implement Google Apps in meaningful ways to increase your students' efficiency, their collaboration, and definitely their engagement. We're going to focus first on Google Drive. It can be a filing system, a cloud storage solution to store artifacts of student learning. So um, the work that the students are creating can still be on pen and with pen and paper or crayon and paper. They don't all have to be digital, but they can be stored in Google Drive. And we're going to look at some different ways to do that. So when you, uh, especially for younger grades, and I feel like elementary, um, the younger grades, it's it's the hardest to make the connections between how students should be going digital um, when they're in kindergarten and first grade because it is so important. They're learning to write their letters and words and sentences and numbers. And so those motor skills are so important. So I'm not suggesting that you replace any of that with a, a computer keyboard or a touchscreen tablet in any way. What I'm suggesting merely is that you photograph their projects or you take your phone or a tablet in your classroom and you create videos, even uh, hand it off to the students. Let them do a voiceover, or like kind of like a think aloud, where they are filming their product, their paper and pen product, but talking about their process, their thinking process, their writing process, how they solved a math problem, how they solved a science problem, how they reflect on improve, improvements they made in, in their learning. So this could be documented. documented um, just in your daily classroom activities, such as daily five, cafe, uh, word work, read to self, things like that. So students can make these videos and then you upload them into your Google Drive account. So this is an example that I'm sharing. This is an authentic example from a first grade classroom here in Wake County, um, where the teacher created a template in Google Drive using Google Slides which is just like PowerPoint, but of course it's in Google, it's in the cloud. And this example was a how-to. The students made leaf rubbings in class, and so she took pictures of their actual products and put them in a single presentation and then copied the presentation over and over again for the students. So this is, this is what you'll see here, and I actually um, have a link on the bottom of the screen, so later when I share this, you'll be able to get to um, see her entire presentation, but actually, I'll go ahead and click on it, um, just to kind of show you. So it's not just this one slide. Uh, she created several slides, and it's their process, and then copied it again and again. 
So you can just kind of see here as I click on them, the materials. And then she had the students. She just put a, a key word here first, then after that, last, and a closing. And she had the students actually write the steps they took to create this leaf rubbing. So I'm going to go back. All right, the next slide I'm showing you is how she set it up. Now, she made a list using a Google spreadsheet and put the students' first names in different cells and then a link to their unique link to their presentation. Um, over here on the right, and I have it covered up with the do not symbol because I didn't want anybody getting into this because this is real. This is a real first grade classroom is using this. Um, I put a short link. What the short link does is it brings up this sheet, this Google Sheet. Now this teacher didn't want the kids logging in because in Wake County, their usernames are very long. It's their student ID number and it's time consuming to log in. She just wanted them to be able to edit. She shared the presentation so anyone with the link could edit and she just needed them to get to that link but not of course type this big long thing in. So instead we made a short URL and the students could type in that short URL and it would bring up this whole Google spreadsheet. They would find their name and then click on their link to edit their own presentation. So this is what it looks like um, inside Google Drive when I look at it. Um, I can see a copy for each of the students. She just renamed them with their first name. Now, another option here you could do is you could actually create a folder for each student in Google Drive. So if you were going to have them log in, and, you know, by first grade they could log in. Um, actually, I've seen kindergartners logging in, um, and it's pretty, pretty wonderful. But um, you could have them log in and have a folder for each student where they go into their folder and the teachers drop this template in there, and then they edit the template from there. So if you want to do that, if you want to create a, a uh, folder for each of your students, you could kind of set it up almost like a portfolio. And what I would do is maybe set it up by quarter. Um, and then, if, of course, if you have older students, set it up by semester or class period and, and just to organize it because you have so many students. But when you set it up by uh, folder, then you can have subfolders within that folder for each of the different quarters. And you can save all kinds of samples. It's not just things you're creating in there, but you're saving examples of their work that then when you have a parent conference, you can share with the parents. Um, it's a great way to show growth over time. You know, things in third semester or third quarter compared to first quarter look a lo whole lot different. Those kids have a, um, many new skills. So to create a Google folder in Google Drive, all you have to do is go into Google Drive, find the red button that says new, click on it, and then the first option you have is to create a folder. When you create that folder, you just name it your student's first name. Uh, the folder is shared with only you, logged in as you, but what you can do at the end of the year is share the share the folders with the individual students' Google accounts so that they have that record moving forward. You can even transfer ownership yourself. So you're the owner of anything you create or upload into Google Drive, but you can transfer ownership and make the child the owner. One thing nice, if your student starts out in kindergarten, first grade, um, by the time they're leaving your school in fifth grade, they have artifacts from all the grade levels in elementary school and it's just something that they continue to add on to as they go into middle school and then high school which doesn't really sound like that big a deal but as a parent of a child it sure would be nice to have digital copies of my kids work especially uh, videos with voiceovers from when they were little So Google Drive can definitely be cloud storage, but it's also 
it contains five Google Apps inside Drive that allow students to create and collab collaborate with other learners. So these are the five apps, and we're going to look pretty closely at a couple of them, not all of them. So the first one I want to look at is Google Docs. Google Docs are terrific for research, for writing, for planning. Um, they make collaboration very easy. All a student has to do or the teacher has to do is share the link or share a doc with a, another person's Google account to make them an editor. One advantage to using Google Docs is a teacher can provide feedback but not just the teacher. A student can share the document with a specialist, with a parent, or even with peers if they would like to get some peer feedback. So this is the share, these are the different sharing settings inside Google Docs. So whoever creates the document gets to choose. Do you want other people to be able to edit, comment, or simply view? This is an example inside Google Docs. When you click on the pencil in the top right corner, it actually lets you, as an editor, change your own level of um, writing on that document. So as a teacher, I know it's hard for teachers not to fix what students are doing wrong. Instead, you can click on the pencil and click on suggestion, suggesting or suggestion mode. And then the um, edits that you would recommend to kids actually show up with green highlighting. And in the next slide, you'll see that. This is where I suggested, I put it in suggestion mode, and everything starting with the word if, all the way to the word writing at the bottom, was a suggestion. Now, if this was a student's paper and they liked my suggestion or we were collaborating together, the other student, the owner of it, could just click on the check mark and that suggestion would become a permanent part of the paper. This uh, student, the other students I'm collaborating with could also reject my suggestion by clicking on the X and that would delete it from the body of my writing, plus it would delete this um, comment box. But we can also have a conversation. There's a reply option here we can actually have a conversation about the writing um, or in the suggestions that we're making. So this is something that a lot of people don't realize, and I'll go back to that slide. It's in Google Docs. It's where the pencil is, and there are three different options that you can give other people or that you, you yourself have access to. So a couple different ways I would use Google Docs in my classroom, provide students with the link and either, you know, if you're one-to-one -one or if you are not one-to-one, -one, which is in some ways even better, you could have students grouped where there's one note taker per group and you could pause class frequently and let students have a conversations and discuss information that you're giving them and make notes to a single common document that you are projecting at the front of your room at the you know somewhere in your classroom on the wall um, this is something you can share with all the students you can make it so that they can edit during class so they can take notes during class and put their ideas up there but also this makes it really visible so that you can see if there's a problem if they're not getting something or they um, have misinterpreted something that you're that you've shared with them so you can kind of curb that before the misunderstanding becomes a part of their knowledge. Um, it's a great way to um, intentionally model note taking also. So as the teacher, you can be modeling and thinking out loud as you are adding to the notes as well. It's a great way to get students started on a research process of some sort. Um, also, you can, after class, you can switch it so that they can't edit or add any more notes to it. And then you could publish it and put it on your school website or your LMS, whatever it is you're using. So students who are absent can access the notes from home, 
but also the students who were in your class that day can access their work, their writing, and their classmates' work from home. So it's a really great tool for that. Think of all those papers that those students are taking home over the, over the course of a school year, over the course of their time in elementary school. So one thing I really like is using Google Drive to organize and share my learning. Um, this is an example from a workshop that I attended where I took some photographs of the slides and then I may have taken notes as well and put them in a Google folder. So you can ar archive things you've learned, archived, archive um, events in Google Drive. You can also share with parents during conferences. You can share with specialists and other teachers if your students have see a special ed teacher or, um, or if you'd like to work with um, a different content area teacher, like one of the teachers that teaches an elective, and integrate your content areas together so that the students are kind of double dipping. So this is another example where you'll see day one notes on the right, and you'll see a photograph of a, of a slide that I must have thought was important. So you're, you're teaching the students metacognition and really thinking about their own learning. So this is um, a workshop that I went to, the art and science of presenting, and you can see I made a bunch of Google documents where I took notes along the way. And up here at the top, you can see where I've shared it with these four people plus five more, so nine other people. And so they were typing on these documents alongside with me um, as we were learning during this professional development. So it's not just good for kids, it's good for adults too. Okay, so here, if you want to go ahead and uh, open a new tab and type in this short URL, uh, case does matter. So the D-H-O and then the O-P that are purple are all capital letters, and those are O's, not zeros. If you'll go ahead and type in this short URL, you will get to a Google Doc that anyone with the link may edit. And I want to point out that we are, in this Google document, we are going to be communicating using writing, which is good practice for kids. Purposeful writing is considered collaboration when students are working together to share their thinking and their learning. So just us sitting next to each other working together isn't the same as collaboration. That's more of a cooperative event. But if we're sharing ideas and arguing maybe and debate, debating back and forth, then uh, the real deal is happening. So I'm going to demonstrate a couple things in here. I'm going to demonstrate how we can do this, how we can work uh, collaborat collaboratively from anywhere. So I'm clicking on the link myself, going to the shared document, and you can see, you won't see yourself up here at the top, but you will see other collaborators. And so I see some of my favorite people that I work with here in Wake County up at the top. And so put your cursor anywhere in the document and you may type. And you may type anything, anywhere. So you could see where this would be a fantastic collaborative document where you could have kind of guiding questions or have the students come up with the guiding questions. Before I was talking to you about switching from edit mode to suggestion or viewing mode. So go ahead and give that a try where you can make a suggestion on the document. And you'll see it showing up in green highlighting. And then you can reply to one another, etc. We can delete, we can check mark. When I check mark, I approve, etc.
So a couple other things I want to show you um, here in this document is we can be working from anywhere. So this is a great one to use on a bad weather day if students are stuck at home. Um, it's something students can initi initiate with one another. You know, it may take some practice and guidance the first few times, but especially I would say third grade and older, they could eventually um, initiate at home and collaborate from home. So if there is a day where there's no school, um, they can continue to work on learning and sharing and collaborating. So a couple other things I want to show you in this. If you click on the word file, you will see, well, first of all, for older students especially, especially when the teacher puts them into groups, you will see the option to see revision history. And that'll pop up, and you'll see who made what edits when. Okay, and there is a button at the bottom that says show more detailed revisions. And so it'll give you very detailed revisions. So if you've chosen the, the groups for the students and there's a slacker in the group and the kids want to, you know, kind of prod them along, they can say, hey, I've got proof that you didn't contribute to our document by looking at the revision history. Also, you're going to see this option to publish to the web. When you choose that option, you can get a link. And what happens is any new updates are made, they're automatically published to the web as well. You can also get an embed code. So if you click on embed, embed and then click publish, you're gonna get um, an iframe, which is HTML code. So if you are the, uh, a web builder at your school and you'd like to embed this document in your school website, you, you would use that embed code. The advantage to doing this, um, a Google Doc in a, embedded in a website, is that um, any new updates you make to that document, so if this was your newsletter, for example, those updates would automatically be published and republished. So it's going to happen in pretty close to real time, depending on the internet. Um, another really great advantage to that is it can be seen by parents of the children on any device. It doesn't mean they have to have Microsoft Office. It doesn't have to be on a computer. It can be on a mobile device or a tablet, and they will be able to access it. Because this is cloud-based, it's not dependent on software. And then my very favorite thing, and this is especially for your reluctant writers or students that um, kind of get stuck in a hole, is at the top you'll see the tools bar, and under it you're going to see voice typing. This pops up, and I use this all the time. Um, when you're trying to summarize something that you've read, you could actually have the book or the article open on another computer. You can click on click to speak. Put your cursor somewhere first, maybe. Here, I'll put it in a blank spot. Click to speak, and I'm talking now, and my computer is typing for me. So for students, um, who really have a hard time getting started, this is a great way they can dictate to their computer and the computer can take notes for them. For language learners who are practicing articulation skills and even elementary children who are practicing articulation skills, this is really great because it's a little better than Siri in understanding me and it pretty much gets the logistics of what I'm saying. I can even say period and it will end my sentence and bring me to a new line. But your students will need to go back and edit and uh, make corrections as far as spelling and word choice, etc. So it's not like they're totally skipping out on writing. It, it's really just a tool to uh, get them started, make writing easier, and sometimes kids think so quickly and they can't possibly type as quick as they think. And what we're concerned with mostly is their content and not their ability to type. So um, this is a fantastic writing tool for all students and all learners and uh, teachers don't need to actually use it themselves or know how to use it themselves. They just need to make kids aware that it exists in Google. 
I'm going to close that. And I'm actually going to go back to the presentation. So the next page on the presentation just shows revision history. Um, and this is a note-taking template I'm uh, using for a school, a, co a college-level class. And uh, my classmates are in different parts of the state, so we type in this together. So stop lugging all those data notebooks home every week or every night. Or if you're like me, Friday night, you lug them home in your car and they sit in your trunk till Monday and then you lug them back to school. They're pretty heavy, uh, especially if you get 25 or more of them in a box. Instead, provide students a digital forum for keeping track of their learning. And this could be a science data notebook, it could be a writing journal. Um, the students could set it up themselves. Um, if they're a little bit older, they could set it up in a Google folder. You could even put a link to all their folders on a Google website so it's somewhere quick that they can get to. But they need to share it with you in a way where you, the teacher, can give them feedback while they are writing. So the advantage to going digital with Google is you can actually give them feedback while they're collecting data and while they're doing their work instead of waiting till the end and having it be a, a graded gotcha moment. So the next slide, this is an example of reading logs that we did, and we did this at Leesville Road Elementary a couple years ago um, and presented at NC Ties, Green Levy and I, and we did this with fifth graders. The teacher was sick of the fifth graders bringing in their crumpled up reading logs on paper. The kids were pretty much sick of doing it on paper and then losing the paper. And so we tried to make it more interactive and more engaging for them. And at the time, we didn't have Google accounts in Wake County. So when you get a copy of this presentation, there is a link to an editable version of this Google um, reading, reading log. It, we used forms to make it. And the only way for me to share this with you in a way where you could reuse it is to make you editors in this. So when you get this, you'll go to slide 23 and in the speaker notes, you'll find a link and it does allow you to edit, but instead of editing, if you will just go in and make yourself a copy of it and then edit your own copy. Just kind of want you to see that this, this is an option for students um, and they don't need to log in at all. And you could change this for, you can change this up for younger kids. Um, we actually got a lot of feedback from the fifth graders. We went and interviewed them and found out that they wanted to set their own reading goals and they wanted to make different reading goals different weeks depending on what they had going on in their life. Um, we wanted them to be able to um, not only put what they were reading and also um, write about it, but also sometimes they decide not to finish a book. They decided it's just not for them. And so we wanted them to be able to voice why, really uh, gain a lot of insight into who they are as a, as a reader. This particular reading log template, we also put an option where the students could have a, they could create a different reflection based on the day of the week. So they would choose, you know, if it was Tuesday or Wednesday, and then they would, it would give them a guiding question. We also tried to make it so that they could pick between nonfiction and fiction, or you know, kind of have the questions be different based on the genre they're reading. But this is a great place for you to get started if you want to reuse this, but make it your own, make it way better, make it fit your classroom. Just make a copy of it and definitely feel free to use it. So another thing we've done is word walls, and we've uh, Base this on the Freyer model, kind of a, this is a, actually a Google slideshow presentation uh, where you can get the students, give the students the autonomy to create the different slides. So this would be a great way to do a cumul cumulative unit uh, and have all the vocabulary be re represented by different slides. In Google Slides or Google Presentations, there are so many different options, including you have access to an online dictionary, 
and images and even videos. And I'm going to show you in the next um, the next slide. So here's this is a short link to ooh whoops. This is a short link to the template itself. So if you will click on that link up here, it will take you. And I'm gonna have to get out. Keeps taking me to the next slide. It will take you to the template. Just gonna copy that. And this is approximately what you'll see. So these slides, I always give students one slide to decorate just for fun. I mean, kids, kids like to be creative and once you show them the really cool tools I'm about to show you, they're gonna wanna have some fun with this and not just do work. But the other one has specific directions. So say you have more kids in your class than what I've accounted for here, which is only 12 slides, so six students. You can actually take and select the slides, hold the shift button down, shift button down to select a whole bunch at once, and then you can control or command C, which is copy, and then command or control V, paste. And so it just pastes the slides. So this is a great way, if you had a class of 40, you could just keep making them. So then the trick is to assign each student a number, actually a couple numbers. So I would assign you as my student slide three and four. On slide three, you can put your name, you could decorate it, change the color, add shapes, add images. But slide four is really the meat of it. I'm gonna give you this vocabulary word, quadrilateral, and you can work with a partner, and the two of you have to um, put some examples, put some images, define it, et cetera. So it sounds, sounds kind of hard. But it's actually not, and I'm going to give you an example using the word autonomy, which I've already done for you. If you go to the top, you're going to see the word tools in the toolbar. And then if you click research, it's actually a Google search bar that comes up. And everything lets you search everything on the web. So sometimes students can type the word right in and search the web and they will get all kinds of results, definitions, Wikipedias, images, sometimes even um, uh, you know, videos and other things. Or you can choose what you'd like. Okay, So you can go strictly to images. Videos doesn't work real great here. Um, there, I, there's a different way to insert videos that I like a lot better, um, which I'll show you. But I love to use the dictionary feature. So a student could be lazy and just copy it and paste it, but you're gonna see what happens when I do that. It makes it really, really small and it usually has highlighting behind it. In fact, you can see it's white behind it. Um, so they'd have to monkey with the um, font and all that. And you're gonna know if they did that. I want it in their own words. I want it in a kid-friendly definition because they're teaching their classmates what the word autonomy means. The image option is fantastic and they can even, once they select the image option, they can even find this drop-down arrow and change the usage rights. If they use images that are not filtered, they might be breaking copyright law. But if they click on free to use, share, or modify, even commercially, they're allowed to use those images. So if I wanted to use this image in my picture, I would simply drag it and drop it. And there it is. So I'm not saying that this Google search bar is perfect for everything, but it's certainly a great option. And if you filter the images or suggest the students filter them, it will filter out some of the unwanted Im images that you might get searching the whole entire web. So I was going to show you the insert video feature from this window is actually better because you can search you YouTube. So if there were a video on autonomy, 
support. And I won't even search that one because that's that's a pretty tricky one to find. But I will show you Sir Ken Robinson because there's lots of videos on him. And you can actually scroll down and choose one. You could preview it here or you can just select it. And when you select it, it actually inserts the video where you place it and it'll come up. Okay, which doesn't really make sense with the word autonomy, so I'm going to delete it. But I just wanted to kind of demo that. All right, so let me go back to the presentation. So when you insert images, Onto your slides, you're going to see a crop button. So you can see here I researched golden retrievers. I took an image that was free to use, share or modify, and you can see the usage rights right here. And I took this image and I just popped it over here. So you can resize it using these blue bars. No more, you know, the days of downloading an image, resizing it because they're gigantic, and then uploading it into a PowerPoint. Those days are over. No more. This is so much easier. And here you can actually, there's a crop feature, which will put some black lines on here where you can actually crop the image, but you can cut it out into fantastic special little shapes like this, the little cloud bubble like they're talking, or a circle. So what I was thinking is, this would be a great way if you're teaching students how to make their own logo or to brand themselves if they're creating a something together and they need to and they want to create their own brand because they can always and again we're in uh, Google Slides they could always add a text box over the image where they could put their name change the font color and put it right over the image. How else might your students use a feature such as this? I'm sure you could come up with more ways. So back to the presentation. Um, Another feature I want to show you is Google Keep that a lot of people don't realize that the students even have access to. But if you go to your Google Apps and Google Drive, if you go to that little gray Rubik's Cube and look at all your different Google Apps, you will find Google Keep. And I'm going to show you mine even though it's probably not pretty. But I am going to, going to just open a new tab. And since I'm already logged into Google, I'm just going to type keep.google.com. And you can do the same if you're logged in. And it will go to your Google Keep, which is kind of like a little post-it notes for yourself. So you can make to-do lists. You can label them for work, for home. You can even make a grocery list, share it with your spouse. So kids that are working on projects together, if they need to bring in a bunch of materials from home, they can make a list, share it with one another. Um, so this is how you share. Um, you can change the color of your list. You can archive it. It'll save in your Google Drive. And there are more options here. You can also add images. In this one, I added an image to the top of an American Girl doll. Um, I was talking to somebody about that. I tagged it as work. It really was work, I promise. But just to kind of show you, they can add images to it. So there's a whole lot of a whole lot of things that they can do with uh, Google Keep. So check it out if you haven't already. I'm telling you, elementary students, they will love this. They will eat this up because they will make lists and they will become more organized. And then as you complete your tasks, you can check the box and it X's it out for you. But you know, they're just like us. They need they need a visual reminder, and they, they need a way to keep track of what they've got going on because their lives are busy, too. Okay. 
All right, so there's some options to kind of show you, or some more slides to show you what uh, Google Keep can do, and it's available on any kind of phone. So if your students don't have access to a computer at home or the internet. So we've only got six more minutes, and I'm just going to run through the last couple slides real quickly. Um, this slide is about Google Maps, My Maps, and we just turned it on last week. Our technology services department um, just turned it on for elementary, middle, and high students. So students have access, and it's not like regular Google Maps. It doesn't just give you directions. You can actually build layers on a map. Um, so this is an example, and you'll be able to get to this again at the end. Uh, American Pop Culture, and it's one I worked on right before lunch today. And so I added a layer for rock music, and I added some rock stars that are part of our pop culture. And so you can see Elvis Presley. If you click on the green circle, that's his, his uh, pin. And I actually embedded a video in here. Students can embed videos. Hey guys, I'm Peyton. Teaming up. Oh, there's commercials for that one. Skip it in one second. And you'll actually get to hear Elvis Presley playing blue suede shoes. Takes a couple seconds to get started. But it's one for the money, two for the show. But we we'll get ready now. Go, Pat, go, but don't you step on my blue suede shoes. Well, you can do So you can check that out later. But um, I put images or videos on all of these different rockers as part of our pop culture. And so you can look at their pins on the map and find them. And I put it based on where they were from, where they were born. All right, so we made it to the end. Um, with a couple minutes to spare, I just wanted to make sure that you had access to this presentation, which is loading. And there is the short URL. So if you will type this in, you have viewing access and you can make a copy. It will have all my speaker notes in it. And please feel free to use this with uh, your colleagues, share it with them and make changes to it and, and reuse this presentation. It will also be archived in YouTube. Uh, yeah, YouTube. So if, if there's anything here that you wanna go back and visit later, feel free. But thank you for viewing, we appreciate it. Erica says so long, and uh, just so you know, uh, Digital Learning Day, even though today's the official day nationwide, um, this is something that we're going to continue throughout the year, sharing examples of digital learning, how, how our teachers and how our students are using the digital, the digital tools available to them here in Wake County and across the state as well. Thank you. I muted it, but I think I should keep it up for three more minutes okay. in case anybody can't get to the... So I don't see... I don't like the fact that there's not a way to chat. Oh man, it's showing you. It flipped off your slideshow. It did. Mm -hmm. Share your screen again. I am. Oh, all right. I'm hanging up now. I'm stopping. Bye. Thank you.